Growing up, topology was one of those subjects that I was endlessly curious about. But whenever I googled YouTube videos trying to learn it, I only ever saw vague analogies about donuts and coffee cups being the same thing. And this always left me thinking, fine, but where's the math? So to learn it, I ended up taking a course about topology. I was expecting to learn all these beautiful geometric formulations and concepts, but boy was I disappointed. It was just a bunch of real analysis jargon, very little about donuts and coffee cups at all. But all of that changed a few years later when I took a course in algebraic topology. You see, algebraic topology is the study of using algebra, so group theory and ring theory, to study spaces and topology. There, I finally got to learn all the precise definitions in the subject. It was so beautiful and so fascinating, but it was really complicated. These concepts simply weren't YouTube explainable. But if you know me, there's nothing I love more than a challenge. So in this video, I wanted to explain a fundamental concept from algebraic topology as best as I can without too many prerequisites. I'll cover one of the fundamental concepts in the subject called simplicial homology. These words probably don't mean much now, but they will by the end of the video. Once we cover that, we'll discuss singular homology. But before that, we should start with the basics. The basic question in algebraic topology is, how many holes does a space have? This is not as silly of a question as it may seem. For example, when we look at a torus, we can clearly see that there's a hole in the middle. But if you were an ant living on the surface of the torus, from your perspective, it looks flat. How would you convince the ant that the torus has a hole? Homology answers this question. Homology is based on the following myth. If you have a closed loop in a space, it must bound a 2D region in your space. But if your space has a hole, this is not true. Consider the loop that goes around the hole in the middle of the torus. This doesn't bound a 2D region on the torus. Of course, it bounds this pink region which is in the space around the torus, but that doesn't count because it's not literally on the torus. Therefore, the torus has a hole. In other words, a hole is a loop which does not bound any 2D region in the space. But the problem with this is that it's not rigorous. It's not clear what loop, bound, and 2D region mean. We need to make it precise. To do this, we need to look at our spaces differently. We're going to break them into pieces called cells. Just like how in biology, cells are the smallest and simplest pieces. They're the building blocks of all organisms. In homology, cells are the simplest building blocks of a space. What is a cell? A zero cell is a point. A one cell is a line. A two cell is a triangle. Let's label the vertices of the left two cells, as well as the sides of the rightmost cell. We need these cells to have orientations, which we denote by arrows. For example, we think of this one cell as starting at the left point and ending at the right point. An orientation for a two cell is a choice of arrow either going clockwise or counterclockwise, along with arrows for all the sides. Using these arrows, we can define the boundary of a cell. For example, the boundary of this one cell is the endpoint minus the start point, B minus A. For the two cell, we travel along the rotating arrow. If the orientation of that one cell goes in the same direction as the orientation of the two cell, we give it a plus sign. If it goes in the opposite direction, we give it a minus sign. So the boundary of the two cell is x plus y plus z. And the boundary of a zero cell is always zero by convention. Now what if we flip the orientation of the one cell? The boundary is now a minus b. What if we flip the orientation of the side z in the two cell? The boundary is now x plus y minus z. How does this relate to holes? Recall that a hole is measured by a loop which does not bound any 2D region in the space. We can now rephrase this in terms of cells. Well, what is a loop? Here are several collections of one cells that are loops. Let's calculate their boundaries. Notice that their boundaries are all zero. Using this intuition, we say, a loop is a collection of one cells with boundary zero. What does it mean that the loop doesn't bound any 2D region in the space? It means that it isn't the boundary of any collection of two cells in the space. For example, the boundary of this triangle is a loop but it does not represent a hole, because it's the boundary of a two-cell, namely the triangle. So far, this is pretty abstract, so let's look at some concrete cases. Let's start with the simplest example, the circle. The first step is to represent the circle using cells, as follows. If we take a one-cell, let's call it B, and identify both endpoints with a single zero-cell, A. If we imagine gluing the ends together, we get a circle. Repeating what we said earlier, a hole is a collection of one cells with boundary zero, which is not the boundary of any two cells. So this computation consists of two steps. One, find all the two cells with boundary zero. And two, figure out which of these is the boundary of two cells. Let's start with step two, because it's the easiest. This diagram has no two cells, 
so none of the one cells can be boundaries of two cells. For step one, let's start by calculating the boundary of the one cell B. It's the start point minus the end point, A minus A, which is zero. So B has boundary zero. By the way, this del is the notation that's used for boundary. But what if you go around the circle twice? This is the loop 2B. The boundary of 2B is twice the boundary of B, which is zero, because the boundary is linear. So 2B satisfies the first criterion. You can also go around the circle in the reverse direction. This is the loop minus B. Its boundary is negative one times the boundary of B, which is zero. So minus B also satisfies the first criterion. Now consider the loop n times b, where n is any integer. For the same reason, this loop also has boundary 0. Therefore, the one cells satisfying our criterion are n times b, where n ranges over the integers. Therefore, the one cells with boundary 0, which are not the boundaries of two cells, is the set n times b, where n ranges over integers. Since this is a mouthful, topologists have a name for it, the first homology group of the circle x, denoted h1 of x. This definition of homology is sometimes called simplicial homology, because simplices are another word for cells. We'll now look at a more interesting example. But before that, a brief word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Incogni. In today's day and age, our personal information is easier than ever to find online. Our data is constantly collected and sold by brokers, often without our knowledge. And that's why it's crucial to remove your info from these lists. That's where Incogni comes in. Incogni scans data broker databases for your personal information and submits removal requests when records are found. This lowers your risk in the event of a data breach. And they don't just do this once either. They'll rescan and resend fresh waves of removal requests to data brokers and people search sites. This will help your level of protection improve over time. Use the code Aleph at the link in the description and get 60% off of an annual plan. So far, we've studied the homology of the circle. But things are slightly more complicated when we look at higher dimensional spaces, like the torus. This is the surface of a donut with the insides not filled in. First, we need to describe the torus as a collection of cells. Take a rectangle and label the sides as follows. First, glue along the side A. You get a cylinder. Then glue along the side B. You get a torus. Notice that all four vertices of the rectangle, which I'm calling V and coloring green, become the same point on the torus. They first become these two points on the cylinder, and then they become this one point on the torus. But remember that two cells are triangles, but what we have here is a rectangle. However, if we add one extra one cell here, call it C, then the rectangle is now divided into two two cells. We can call them U and L for upper and lower, and give them some orientation. To calculate the homology, let's first find the one cells with boundary zero, the loops. The cells A, B, C all have boundary zero. So the one cells of boundary zero are all the integer linear combinations of A, B, C. Let's now find the one cells which are boundaries of two cells. The two cells are U and V. The boundary of U is C minus A plus B. The boundary of V is C minus A plus B. So this is equal to all the integer multiples of C minus A plus B. The first homology group of X is this modulo this. This equals the set of all integer multiples of a and b. Therefore, h1 of x is isomorphic to two copies of the integers as a group. This reflects the fact that the torus has two holes, which I'm drawing here in blue. Again, this definition of homology is sometimes called simplicial homology because simplices are another word for cells. Given these examples, we can define homology in general. First, we can take our definitions of cells and make them work in any dimension. Let's define them precisely. For a one cell, consider the real number line. Take the origin, zero, and the number one. Fill in the points between them. That line is a one cell. For a two cell, consider R2. We take the origin and the two basis vectors. Then fill in the triangle determined by these three points. That shape is a two cell. Now for a three cell, consider R3. We take four points in three dimensional space, the origin and the three basis vectors. Then fill in the volume and we get a three cell. Notice that this is a tetrahedron with the inside filled in. To make a four cell, we can continue the pattern, even though we can't visualize it. We take the origin and four basis vectors in R4. Then we fill in the four dimensional volume. Precisely, you take the convex hull of those points, if you're familiar with that term. In general, for an n cell, we take the origin and n basis vectors in Rn. Then we fill in the n dimensional volume determined by those points. What is a whole? 
Well, we saw before that a whole is a collection of one cells with boundary zero, which is not the boundary of two cells. We might want to call this a one-dimensional whole. And the set of all of these is H1 of X, which we called the first homology group. In general, an n-dimensional whole is a collection of n cells with boundary zero, which is not the boundary of n plus one cells. The set of all of these is Hn of x, which we call the nth homology group. But what do we mean by a higher dimensional whole? For example, consider the torus, triangulated as before. Let's calculate H2 of x, which counts the number of two-dimensional holes. This is the space of two cells with boundary zero, modulo those which are boundaries of three cells. There are no three cells, so this thing is zero. What are the two cells with boundary zero? We calculated the boundaries of u and l already. We can see that u minus l has boundary zero. So this is the set of all integer multiples of u minus l. Therefore, we've calculated h2 of x. It's isomorphic to one copy of the integers. This means that the hollow torus has one two-dimensional whole. This two-dimensional whole is the volume inside the torus. But now we run into an issue. Consider the circle. Earlier, we represented our circle like this, but we can easily represent it in another way, say like this. What's the homology now? We see that the one cells with boundary zero are x plus y and any integer multiple of this. There are no two cells. So the homology is still one copy of the integers, just like last time. But even more, in both cases, the generator of h1 is still representing the same thing, a loop that goes around the circle once, Here's a miracle. The homology groups of a space do not depend on how we choose to represent the space using cells. This is a highly non-obvious theorem. These are genuinely different ways to represent the space, and they give you a genuinely different set of calculations, but when you take homology, you get the same answer. Okay, so this is fine and good, but the definition of homology is quite clunky. You have to pick a triangulation, calculate the homology, and then show that the result is independent of the triangulation you chose. Ideally, we'd like a more intrinsic definition of homology that doesn't require us to make any choices. To do this, people came up with a more abstract formulation of homology called singular homology. But this is really weird when you first see it, so bear with me for a moment. Suppose you have a space X, and you have a map sigma from an N cell to X. The image of this map you can think of as a cell drawn on the surface of X. If you have two such maps, say sigma 1 and sigma 2, we can consider formal integer linear combinations of them, like 5 times sigma 1 minus 6 times sigma 2. And any such linear combination of maps we're going to call an n chain. We now consider the set of all n chains on x. This is a huge infinite set. Quotient this out by the chains which are boundaries of n plus 1 dimensional chains, denoted hn sing of x. This is called the nth singular homology of x. Now, this is very abstract. We have to consider all possible end chains and all possible boundaries. It should be clear that this is completely infeasible for hands-on calculation. But the benefit is that it doesn't involve making any auxiliary choices. The definition is completely intrinsic to the space. But there's another more important advantage. The benefit of singular homology is that it's good for proving theorems. A lot of theorems that are hard to prove in simplicial homology become effortless two-line proofs when you use singular homology. But we should address this fact. So far, we have two ways of defining homology, singular and simplicial homology, which I'll write as hn simp. A priori, they have nothing to do with each other, but it turns out, and this is by no means an obvious theorem, that they are in fact isomorphic. So the moral is, if you have to compute, use simplicial homology, but if you have to prove abstract theorems, use singular homology. If you're interested in learning more about homology, Trevor from the channel Mathemaniac has made a beautiful video about a concept closely related to homology called the Euler characteristic. It's a wonderfully made video, so you should definitely go check it out. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next video.